Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri, and our next guests are the stars of the new Night in the Life cop film, Crown Vic. In it, Thomas Jane plays a veteran patrolman out in the wild with a rookie cop. Along the way, they meet with a couple psychotic fellow members of the force, played by David Krumholtz and Josh Hopkins, as well as Greg Bella, who also serves as a producer of this very fine film. Let's take a look at Crown Vic. LAPD, I want you to open the door and put your hands outside the vehicle. Now! Oh, they got you breaking in a rookie tonight. Anybody here named Holland? Yes, sir. Nick Holland, that's me. Uh, you gonna get in? I want you to listen. There is the world inside this squad car, and there's everything else outside of it. But after tonight, you're either gonna figure this out, This job is gonna eat you alive. Everything you do and every place you go is a potential situation. I'm telling you, man, it's a war out here. It can be us against them. Follow my lead, do what I do. Holland! Get on the ground or I will shoot you! I don't know if I'm cut out for this. I got something for you to look at. Not bad. Bad as it gets. They got kids. You can't just go off the grid like that. The lesson's over for the night. Where is she? I can't do this right now. I didn't even join up for this. People sleep peaceably in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Hey, you see that? You're learning it already. Everybody, please welcome Thomas Jane, David Crumholtz, Josh Hopkins, and Greg Bello. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on Crown Vic. You know, uh, many a cop film there are in the world, and it's a rarity that I sit down to watch one, and I'm surprised by uh, a lot of the elements that are in it. And I, with this, it's... Incredible performances by all of you, all around, grounded, shocking at times, and it's also the direction and the production. It looks uh, beautiful. A lot of care was put into the making of this film, uh, and it's a pleasure to watch. Thomas, um, what drew you to playing this 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 particular character? Why did you want to play this this kind of cop? I don't know. Alec Baldwin called me and said, hey, I can't do this part. Uh, do you want to do it? Is that really what happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He called me on the phone. It was one of those, this is Alec Baldwin, like, come on, you know. But he's got such a distinctive voice, you know, you, you, so you yeah. got, I kind of knew it was him. When he, when, you know exactly, what I mean? Exactly how it happened, yes. Yeah. yeah. And he Alec Baldwin so, initially oh, yeah, said. Originally, I had, uh, the, the script was written by a good friend of mine, Joel Susan. So originally, I had directed. He also directed, and I uh, originally said, I, I got it to Alec, I brought it to Alec, I've been friends with him for a long time, and he said, I knew it was a good um, I knew it was a good piece for him. It's a great. It's just a really well written role and something that he wanted to do. And uh, and we tried to get this thing done for like two two years. And lo and behold, when it finally came, when we finally finally got everything, all the elements together, and uh, Crumholtz threatened me, you know, not to he wouldn't be my friend anymore if I didn't put him in the movie. Uh, Alec actually, uh, it, a scheduling conflict happened and Alec couldn't do it, but we went, you know, Thomas was our guy and Alec literally did call him up and said, this is, and the funniest thing is, after we had a very rough cut of the movie, it was like a over two hour and 20 minute version, and I'm sitting next to Alec in the screening room, this is after we shot the movie, and he is pounding the table the whole time, and he, he can't believe how real, how great this thing is. And afterwards, uh, can you swear on the show? Oh yeah. All right. Afterwards, he calls. He, <laughs> he calls up T. He calls up Thomas. Oh, good if I you think, gotta ask. You just gotta call. fucking swear. Yeah, you know? exactly. Now fuck, you're asking. Fuck it, we're going with it. Afterwards, Thomas. He calls Thomas and he goes, "You fucking son of a bitch! You fucking stole this role from me. This was mine." But he goes, "You're so fucking great in it. I hate you, but I love you. But I hate you." And it was really, I, I was really proud. I mean, you know, TJ is like. He's like Steve McQueen. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. 
awesome in this movie. I mean, and uh, the, I, I, the only reason I'm going to say you really like Steve McQueen, I've never met him before. We're shooting this thing up in Buffalo, and uh, he shows up to the set. He was just fi finished doing something else, I think. And I just remember reading, I love movies, I remember reading stuff about Steve McQueen, how he'd just come out, he'd show up and listen, you want to cut my hair? You got to cut my hair. You want me to shave? You got to give me a razor. This guy shows up and it's literally, he's got a beard and everything. He goes, whatever you want me to do, just give me the, give me, give me the tools and I'll do it. And I was like, this guy is fucking cool. And, uh, and then. And he needs a shave. And yeah, and Joel, <laughs> tell him what to do. So Alec Baldwin calls you and he says, uh, you got to do this role. You read the script. Clearly, it's a juicy role. Uh, for lack of, It's a meaty role. There's a lot to do there. It's a cop with his own moral compass in a way. Um, what what sort of research do you want to do? I think you've, you've probably played a cop before, right? Uh, no, actually, no. Uh, I really? mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I detected stuff. I just assume stuff, every male right? actor every, Everybody's played a cop played a at cop. some point. Yeah. But, but, but this was a real cop, you know. The, exactly. What was great about the script is that it takes a very real take on what it's really like to be an LAPD cop that's it's not taken out of Hollywood you know it's taken from the streets in uh, real life so I had the good fortune to hang out with uh, some very good officers from the Hollywood uh, police division and the Rampart division um, and we did several uh, ride-alongs at night you know and it was literally just a matter of spending time with these guys hanging out with them asking questions riding in the cop car watching them bust stuff they're like you know the, 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 it's called the curse of the ride-along and you guys have, have all did, yeah. did ride-alongs too we all we all took this took I this didn't. very seriously I didn't do one except for David <laughs> he didn't need to do it he's easy he, yeah, I don't I prepare <laughs> no point so these guys these guys are like, there's something called the curse of the ride-along. You know, every time they get somebody to ride along with them, nothing happens, right? And, but it's, but the, being a cop is a pretty fucking dramatic uh, lifestyle. So what happened? Let's see. We busted an illegal gambling ring. We got in a high-speed car chase with a guy and a girl. The, um, the guy dumped the girl on, a, on, like, a horseshoe. He tried to, he stopped the car, dumped the girl, then he kept going. Then, then the cops got him on the, at, at the end of the road. Um, we, uh, were, we showed up after the, at the aftermath of a shooting, um, and, uh, and that was all before lunch, you know, which, which is at midnight, because it's the night shift, you know, so it was, um, we, 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 we saw quite a lot of, quite a lot of action in L.A. What do you feel like you learned, uh, about veteran police officers that helped you with what, your What I learned was that 99% of police officers are really good human beings, that they are there to serve, that they are there with the right intention, that they are there to uh, be of service to uh, humanity, and that they have a code, um, that there's a brotherhood, that, it's an ex that they protect each other, and that the moral, what we what we citizens would judge it's a different world it's a different world you know and what we citizens would judge and from the outside as being perhaps amoral uh, to them is actually incredibly moral uh, the the code of ethics that they have is incredibly strong that unfortunately we hear about the bad guys um, because that's what makes the national news um, but um, all, most most cops uh, and and all the cops that we've r rode with w said the same thing, you know, uh, and and we're upstanding dudes. Most cops are. In, in, uh, I had I I was I gained a new respect for the um, for the job and for the people who do the job. But then there is that one percent that is represented by your two characters, I think, uh, in the in the movie. <laughs> uh, the Which is why Cromwell didn't have to prepare. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I'm a very bad person. Yeah. Uh, what, Josh? What was it like playing a, um, for lack of a better way to put it, a psychopath, like a complete psychopath? It was. It looks like you're having fun. It was so much fun. <laughs> it was. I mean, just it's it's uh, not too often you get a role where most subtlety goes out the window, you know? So it was, it was 
just great. You know, Joel wrote a great part, and I'm so lucky I got to do it, and I had a ball doing it. You're right. I'm glad it looked fun because I had a ball. I mean, I feel like the key to your role for you as an actor is after you leave the first time, and Thomas says, he's so keyed up on roids and speed, he's going to kill himself <laughs> soon. Like, if I was an actor, I'd be like, oh, that just tells me exactly what I have to do for this part right now. Right. This is yeah, gonna, I overprepared then. <laughs> I got on roids and speed and just, just geeked out. But then there's a moment where his character breaks down, um, and that's such a crushing uh, moment. And he, he just, you know, he played that so incredibly well. And uh, Thanks, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing to watch. Well, that's Did the downside of the roids cry. and the speed, right? Yeah. The roids and the speed shoot you up, but then they also There's the come down, down. yeah, it's, for sure. Well, um, And you get bitch tits. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact. You got to be careful with them roids. Spoken from, uh, from experience, experience? Yeah. Tom. What do you got? It's like an invoice. <laughs> How did the did the two of you know each other prior to your scenes together? Yeah, yeah, we've known each other for quite a long quite, time. Through through Greg, who knows everyone and is a, sort of the unofficial annoying mayor of New York City. Um, he, <laughs> might he, be official. Yeah, He's might be, official be my best now. friend, by the way. Yeah. But uh, go ahead. Um, uh, Greg is a very popular guy because he's a very good guy, very fun to be around him because he bothers people. Oops. Don't, don't yeah, just hurt. Anyway. Sorry, I hurt myself. Um, sorry, sorry. Never mind. I'll stop. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> no. But, how long uh, have you known? How long have you known Greg? I've known Greg for twenty years. How do you guys uh, know each other? He 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 likes to approach famous people, <laughs> and uh, I was true. wildly yeah, yeah, yeah. famous he's at the time. And um, you no, were. No, not really. But he, he, he just, he's, he, he approached me and uh, we had a conversation. And uh, before it was comfortable to do so, he asked me for my phone number. It was hated first sight. And uh, before I could stop myself, I gave him my phone number. And it's a regretful moment, you know, I'm in my life. You know, I was, I was uh, just Can't get in therapy my life. Uh, recently. <laughs> and, you know, it's all about him. So my therapy sessions are all about him. Greg, how have, if this is the case with your personality, how have you only produced two movies at this point? It seems so, like there should be. Listen, this is a new thing. I really, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm just a slacker. I'm like one of what these a, millennial people. That, you what just like the phone you numbers. You don't like to really, do anything with yeah, them. I didn't really, I just wanted to hang out. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, listen, I, I think that, I met him 25 years ago, and I told him then, I said, why aren't you producing? <laughs> so, didn't I? Yeah, I when we, we did G.I. Jane Can't together, we was like... Why did, you say, why did you say that? Just his personality and the way that he... Personality, he's... And he's... He's, he's a, a producer. dick, and all You're producers talk? are dicks. Maybe that's I, I, something I, to do with I, it. I, I watched this guy build this film from the ground up, and uh, I got to say, it was uh, not surprising that he was good at it, but that he was so good at it, and that it, it fit him so naturally, and... Uh, you know, so much of this film is obviously, uh, you know, a collaboration of of really uh, special people. But but Greg is certainly someone who who kind of brought us all together. Or he just got really lucky. Yeah, <laughs> there's that too. Because I mean, there's a lot. We make Good a lot point. of movies. It's rare to get a movie in theaters these days. Yeah, you know, well, that I is think, true. <clears throat> that is true. I think all the things. I I think it's a perfect storm kind of happened. Look. It was, we, Thomas, he is, I mean, he is this guy. It's unbelievable how great he is in this. It, it's one and of the great cinematic performances. <laughs> you really don't make, know how he means. It's he's crazy. Really, great. Great. really amazing. And then Hop, who I, Josh and I met um, when we did G.I. Jane, and I just thought this went. 25 when, years <laughs> ago. Ugh. Oh, that was brutal. Um, G.I. Jane or meeting 25 years ago? Yeah, both. 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 Um, but I, when Joel and I talked about this role, um, I, he liked Josh, he'd known Josh and Josh had done some lighter fare recently, you know, and I said, man, this guy's got the goods to make this happen. And then when it came to Krumholtz, it was like, well, he's threatening me home. not to be my best friend anymore. Well, I wasn't in the that. movie. I I threatened to kill you. And, oh yeah. You're <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was pure. Threatened to choke pure, you, yeah, choke you out in, in your apartment. In some ways, though, it is uh, it is Thanks. kind of like, as you said, a perfect, a, a perfect storm of luck is not the right word, but you've got all the actors who are delivering great performances all around, which ends up coming down to who is available and who wants to do True. it. True. A, a, a lot of that is 
genuine, you know, you got to get lucky, of course, scheduling wise. And look, but you Joel had a director a, who knew how to direct. He had a succinct. He this is as Alex said, this is like part of Joel's DNA, and it's kind of true because he was obsessed with the subject. He went on more ride-alongs than all of us put together throughout his life. He wrote from experiences that happened during these... Uh, his research was in incredible. It really was. I mean... He really did a great job with uh, researching the thing. Exactly. And creating the, uh, you know, something that I, I suppose is, uh, right. you know, not seen very often. No. Which is sort of the, a glimpse into sort of what it's really like, yeah. you know? What, the reason what, what it's is so it really special like? is because it's so ambiguous... The, you know, they don't make movies like this anymore where the audience is left with its own um, disquieting feelings about the film and there's no second act. You know, you see a lot of these kinds of sort of anti-hero stories on television now, but there's episodes to follow where you kind of uh, are, are, are f you know, following a much longer story that takes place over the course of years. Whereas in this one, you are left there sitting in that audience sorting, sort of having to decide how you feel about not only police, but about criminals and about the state of the world we live in where everything is filmed. That's Tell them about perfect. the uh, screening that you guys uh, did. We did several screenings. Tell them about the woman in the audience. Uh, yeah, we've had some pretty violent reactions to the film. Really? I mean, well, certainly, you know, I mean, we live in a culture where opinion is sort of taken as fact and, you know... Um, uh, you can scream them all you want. It doesn't make them any more important than anyone else's. And there was a, there was a couple screenings where we had some very angry young people who felt that we were glorifying uh, police brutality, which, if you watch the film, couldn't be farther from the truth. Sure. Um, if anything, but it's about the consequences of those actions. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, on the people themselves, having to live with themselves. That's what this is. It's a character study. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you want to make it into a political agenda, I suppose you can do that for yourself. But that's why, you know, the police, the, the job of a police uh, man is so divisive, you know. And even, even if you just tell the story straight, just w what they really have to encounter, the choices that they really have to make on a daily basis, you're going to get a d very divisive opinion about w whether or not that cop is doing a right thing or a wrong thing um, from any number of people in our society. So, you know, it's a fun, uh, it's a fun line to walk in this, in this kind of film. You know? I, I think it's a credit to the film that some people have that response. I mean, I think any... Oh, I agree. Great art That's is going to elicit some sort of feeling, whether it be bad or good, rather than meh. So I, I love that some people feel that way, that, some, that it makes people feel passionate one way or another. Well, all That's great very films, much what Joel was going for. All good films do that, or should do that in some way. We just all happen to art. live in this weird age where people's opinions are much louder, and the opinion that is the loudest is the one that is kind of like, give me an easy ending, prove a social point to me, don't just sort of give me something to think about. Everybody wants like a, a an easy ending that ties up. Yeah, and I, I think we're in trouble because uh, so for some reason we start catering to people whose opinions are sort of maybe more conservative or maybe more, you know, what was that thing on campuses where like, don't offend me? You know, I think what you're talking about is offensive, so therefore suddenly, so now we're catering to people because they feel like what they're, what you're doing or saying is offensive. I mean, I, I think that's a breakdown of a free society, to tell you the truth. Um, one of the things that I liked about uh, the direction of the film is the way that it felt to me, like oftentimes I think you can tell when a director lets an actor sort of get on screen and do their thing, and it doesn't become about like really uh, tying them down to what their ideas of the character were, and something feels very free in the performances. And I saw that in the three of your performances. What was it like working, working with Joel? He didn't say a lot. That's no, what I, yeah. He didn't, you're right. And, uh, it was uh, rare. He, he he did any. It would usually be something about the camera, like being, you know, turn a little bit this way or that way. But he let you go, and but I felt confident in it. Sometimes you know you can be like, does does he know what he's doing? Does he know what he wants? His silence. It was like, all right, I, I feel like I'm. Isn't that yeah, weird? Doing you know, because another director's silence, you know, you yeah, kind of get the feeling they don't know what yeah. the fuck they're doing. Right. But or with Joel, you, you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> They've just given up. And, and, yeah. and no, he, this, but he, this okay, is that's not good. Like he knew, you know, he knew what he, you could, you knew that he knew, and and uh, it, was, it was an interesting thing. You're right, because he did not uh, talk too much, but you also knew that he knew what he wanted, and he also, you also knew that that you were free to. Um, 
to to bring whatever whatever you uh, had, you know. Well, to the, I think of to the it, part. It was really a, it was also really nice. remember the script. Was, I oh, <clears throat> I go back to this. I think the script is extremely strong. Yeah. And for actors, for everybody that that is in the movie. I mean, if you're in a scene in this movie, seriously, like, you know, I'm in one scene in this movie. If you're in one scene in this movie, you're in like a seven to ten minute scene. And there are a, a, a plethora of great actresses and actors that are in this movie that can just chew up these parts. We had some terrific people we come in for small parts just people. for a day. We Bridget Moynihan very, came up. Very good I mean, people. Scotty Thompson. We had a great cast because I really go back to the main thing is the Moynihan script. Moynihan was great. Yeah. yeah. And they were all great. But the script is everything. The well, script really does. I think it's often that you can tell when a director believes in their casting versus, versus just believing in their parts. You know, we were talking very briefly during the trailer about Boogie Nights. And one of the things that I've always loved about Boogie Nights is that everybody feels tailor casted to that movie. And the director in, in the director, Paul Thomas Anderson, like allowed them to kind of figure it out and go ahead on their own. I'm sure he was directing the hell out of it in a lot of ways, but I'm sure you felt confident yeah, but and free while the you were Same kind set. of freedom. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, guys who uh, are good at their job tend to cast the right person for the job and then trust them to bring something uh, to the role that, uh, that is going to be uh, truthful. And, uh, and that is an um, interesting kind of alchemy that happens between a director and an actor when you've been chosen for a particular part. But it does start with a script. You know, it does start with a, with, with a part. And it starts with uh, finding an actor that's intelligent enough to uh, understand uh, what has been written and then just kind of letting them do their thing, you know. It's, uh, it's an interesting alchemy that happened. And there, there happened, you know, I think Joel got lucky also in that the group of us are humble actors, you know. There wasn't a, a specific, <laughs> there wasn't a specific agenda that we, any of us had. I want to, you know, rewrite this, or I want to, uh, you know, I don't believe in what this part of the film has to say, so I'm going to twist it in my own little, you know, sneaky way that people won't even notice until the movie comes out. It and still boggles my mind us. when I hear stories of people doing that on a, on a movie. Like, Well, actors why would are some sign... of the worst people I've ever met in my but life. But why would you, like, why would you ever sign on to a movie and then get there and Speak be like, yourself, what bro. can we do here? How can we change this? Because I think my character would actually be the hero in this scene. Like, that's a crazy yeah, thing I, that I, I, I did a film uh, a few years, many years back. Where you I thought you felt like you were the hero. Of the, uh, well, no, I had a, there was a scene where uh, my character had to verbally abuse. It was a comedy, the lead actor. And when I showed up on set, they sent me in, and the actor and the director were screaming at each other. And I walk in, and the director just goes, the scene's being rewritten. <laughs> and it was rewritten as him beating the hell out of me. Oh, for you know what I mean? Sake. And it was just... That was me, wasn't it? Yeah, it was that, me. That you was deserved it, though. You Fuck. admit it. You did, did deserve it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know... I was what much younger do? then. Yeah, um, give I gotta give go us to, a rope we take, you know. I got to go to audience uh, questions, but I would be remiss to not ask you about this since it just ended a couple weeks ago. Uh, the Deuce, which in my mind uh, is one of the great uh, HBO shows to come along in a long time. It had the most to say of, I think, any other show on television in regards to the Thanks. world that we live in now. Sex, uh, men, women, uh, labor. Uh, a really incredible piece of work. Uh, and at the same time, you got to sit across from an actress who I think was delivering the performance of her career in a lot of ways. What Who's, was that? Who's that? Maggie Gyllenhaal. Gyllenhaal. Wow. Oh, yeah, she's terrific. Uh, Maggie is an astounding human being. I mean... Um, he, she, she makes it look easy. Uh, she did, there was one day, I mean, there's many days where her and I just sort of were enamored with each other. And there was one day where she had a two and a half page, uh, monologue that was overtly emotional. And she did it in front of me and in front of the crew, probably 20 times without missing a word or a beat. And each time it got more intense. It's just astounding, especially, uh, you know, when you know the clock's ticking. And, and it's it just her focus uh, is unlike any other actor I've ever encountered. No offense. Uh, you guys are Thanks. close. But Maggie is, um, Maggie is special, and I just rode that wave. I was just lucky to be in scenes with her, you know. I like to imagine that your characters ended up together in, in, the, in the future. Because there was that kiss that was shared, and you were obviously... 
in some ways her soulmate in the in the show. There was just it, it was unrequited. Well, I love I love how it was handled too. You know, like the typical way of handling it is our characters kiss, and next week we have to talk about it, or next week we kiss again. It was literally just they kissed, and they knew in the moment that it wasn't right. It wasn't what their relationship should be, and the relationship got stronger as a result of it. But it never returned to that level. It just remained platonic. It was almost as if they needed to get it off their chests, and that's a credit to David Simon, you know, that he, you know, to make that nuanced choice. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question? Hey guys, uh, I was wondering what is was the most challenging scene to shoot for the film. The love scene between me and David was really tough. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a hair puller. The, the back seat of the car. But I couldn't the, stop grabbing the guy's yeah, hair. He's you know? pulling my hair, and the back oh, seat man. was very cramped. It wasn't written yeah, yeah. that way. Unfortunately, that didn't make it into the movie. Now, I think one of the here's the funniest thing about the. I think it's a great question. I think the funniest thing about it is we started shooting this film. Uh, you know, this movie all, takes place all in one night, and Joel is like, "We're not shooting in a studio. We're outside. We're on the streets. We're shooting this at night." And we started principal photography two days before the summer solstice, which was like the shortest night of the year. Shortest and, nights of the year. That's and right. We had the shortest night, and so we're shooting a movie that takes place entirely at night. And we hit, we really were chasing the darkness every night. I mean, TJ, you remember? I mean, it was every. We we made our days. We made man. our days. We, we made them. But done. I think that. I mean, I've never problem. heard about a movie before chasing the darkness. Yeah, so, we, yeah. Were we were literally. Good title. Yeah, that's the title of, of our next yeah, movie. Exactly. Me and so. Dave's Triple X. <laughs> triple X uh, feature. Chasing yeah. the darkness. I think that was the most challenging for sure. <laughs> Watching it is going to be like chasing darkness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one more. Hi. Uh, with such an intense subject matter, is there anything that you do in between shots to keep things light and fun on set? Mm, masturbating. We had uh, 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 told telling us all good stories. Uh, making fun of me was a big thing for David. and uh, It's true. Well, just watching these guys put each other down was <laughs> fairly entertaining uh, on a nightly basis. It's, it's low-hanging fruit with him. It's I mean. really easy. I mean, yeah. It's been going on for uh, years. It's yeah. If if I didn't have someone to constantly um, mock in my life, um, well, my my children would probably be mocked, and and they don't deserve that. I brought them into this world, so I've got a child here that I can mess with. And uh, no, he is a wonderful. You, I love this man deeply, and again, he bled for this film. Uh, none of us would be here if it weren't for him and, and, and his ideals and. Uh, and uh, yeah, he got really lucky. That's right, and we'll never be here again. Yeah, so enjoy yeah. while it lasts, yeah. pal. Yeah, we'll see you guys. It was a good question too, but it, uh, uh, like we said earlier, like we were chasing the darkness, you know. So it really moved quickly. So we would just take and take and take and take, and then break, and then make fun of him for a second, and then come back. So there wasn't a lot of time to to get tired and get down. So. And we couldn't afford trailers or anything, so these guys, we had to sit in parking lots. That's there. true, yeah. We just hung out in a car. You know, we there's no greenness here. We're all old pros, so we know we knew what it took to get a movie, to make our days, and, you know, nobody wants to be the one that holds up the process. And Except for Josh. He kind of held some shit up. I, remember <laughs> yeah. I did, I, I did. remember. Yeah, yeah. But that's okay. It's surprising to me because all the setups in the film look really beautiful. It doesn't look to me like something that is... Chasing, it's chasing the time, just running, run and gun, handheld. The setups look very smart and very beautiful, and the coverage looks very intentional. Yeah, we have a fantastic we DP. We were also gifted. Unbelievable. With a Thomas Scott Stanton shot this movie. He did a Thomas him and Joel just were terrific. Like this together. And I think the the other thing Joel had, um, he had this thing storyboarded out. He had it. He he knew everything he wanted. Mm -hmm. Before he, and and he knew how he wanted to yeah. shoot it, which exactly. is also, uh, you know, he made choices. You know, the the long lenses and the the way that he would frame his characters and the fact that he, you know, I mean, my God, there are so many close ups in this movie. I mean, the whole yeah. the whole damn movie is practically I mean, yeah. a medium close up. Yeah, I know, um, but that's the way they planned it, and that's the way they shot it, and uh, and it works. You know, it really, really works. So the yep. choices that the director and the DP made to craft the kind of how they wanted to tell the story was uh, extremely effective, you know, and uh, economical you know, in a way that we could get done quickly. Yeah, a movie like this, a film like this, you're doing something that's, like we said, chasing the darkness. You don't have a lot of time. There's obviously not a ton of money. Everybody's got to be prepared. 
And Joel was super prepared for every setup, every scene, every shot, knew what he wanted. But it's a credit also uh, to Thomas and to Luke, who had so much dialogue. It's a really dialogue heavy, obviously, movie. And they were spot on every time. Yeah. Really spot on. That's because they paid us money. (laughs) They paid us money to be there. We figured we better. You got paid? We better do something. (laughs) No, no, no. I I got paid. Yeah, I know. Uh, Guys, uh, congratulations on the film. How can people see Crown Vic? Uh, We open. Uh, Friday night here in New York City at uh, Cinema Village, 12th and University. We're exclusively there for one week, and then we go wide uh, November 15th, uh, 27. 28 cities. 28, I think, I think 30 eight. cities. In theaters. You in can theaters. see it in theaters, yeah. goddammit. This damn is it. a movie I, I encourage you to Get up off your couch, you yeah. go theater. take your girl. This is a movie you uh, want to uh, see in a theater. Or, or your it friend, really and go to a movie. Yeah, yeah it's oh, a great, amazing. it is a real good ride. I mean, it's a great. It really is a fun ride. It's a you. You'll laugh at certain things. And listen, you watch this movie with an audience. It you're gonna really enjoy. It's a very communal experience. It really is because yeah. yeah. And think, as dark as we've said it is, there's a lot of moments of levity in it. If, you know, so it's it's a fun movie to go see. Everybody, give them a huge round of applause. Go see Crown Vic. All right, thank thanks, you guys. guys.